Well, good morning, Brecon Good morning. I know we have a few people sitting here, but there's a lot of people behind that screen. <laughs> this one in the front. So, good morning to everybody. I was going to come in my pajamas because I'm assuming a lot of people at home might be in my pajamas. But Wendy said to me, no way, can you go and stand there in your pajamas? So, we'll open this morning uh, service by reading Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have three readings today. The first one is from 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, we're just going to read verses 1 to 13. It's in my Bible, it's entitled, Samuel anoints David. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him, and they asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Our next reading comes from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And our gospel reading comes from John, John chapter 9. We've got the whole chapter, verses 1 to 41 to read, but I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I did it in the earlier service, but I think what I'm going to do will, will tell you uh, what really happens in the story. This is the, the miracle where Jesus heals a man born blind. 
I'm sure everybody knows the story. I'm sure everyone's read it. And I hope to give you some new insights into the story today. But I'm going to just read some, some parts of it. Um, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Now the Bible doesn't say anything that is irrelevant. It's important that we know that this man is born blind. In my earlier notes, I said he was born blind from birth. And I read that to myself, I had to chuck up. I thought, well, if you're born blind, clearly it's from birth. But anyway, he was born blind. It's important that we know that. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And then the story goes on. And we, we, we read some interesting things. Jesus spits into the ground, mixes up some dirt into mud, puts it on his eyes and says to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And he goes, he washes, and um, some really interesting things happen, which I'll talk about in a, in a slightly different way. But a wonderful story, a really, really nice story. And as I'm trying to get across to, to people, the Bible is written for us, but it was never written to us. And because of that, we need to understand the people to whom the Bible was written. We, we know so much about what's happening in our own culture around us. Things make sense to us. When are you going to do this? I'll do it now. now. We all know that it's going to be done. Now, in six months' time, it will be done. But to people from elsewhere in the world, now, now, there's no reference to it. Does it mean immediately, like in now, now? Or does it mean... No, no, <laughs> the way we understand it. The term, Yarnia, yes, no. It, it has significance for us. We don't need to explain it to each other. Because I don't think we can explain that. But it means something to us. It, 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 it brings about some form of emotion, if you like. And when we read the Bible, there's so much that is not in the Bible, that's omitted. Because the people who, who the stories were written to, the books were written to, would understand the culture of their day. And they would know what is behind what is being written. And we as modern day Christians, Gentiles, are clueless as to all of that. And it becomes important that we start learning what was happening um, around the people. So today's gospel story, it started by saying, as he went along. Well, as he went along, where? Where was he coming from? Where was he going to? When did this happen? These are important things for us to, to, to know because without that, it's just a story. We're placed in time, but it means nothing. He was in Jerusalem. Why was he in Jerusalem? Well, if we go back, I think it's two chapters, we'll find out that it was the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jewish males were expected to go to Jerusalem for three feasts, one of them being tabernacles. Tabernacles was vitally important to them. And Jesus was in Jerusalem for this. What makes tabernacles important? Well, it's a feast where they, where they remember the time that they, they wandered around in the desert. They remembered the time where they were nomads. And so they would erect structures on the roofs of their houses, temporary dwellings, but the roof wasn't closed, it was open so they could see the, the, the heavens. But what is even more important, you can go back into Kings, I forget exactly where it is now. And when Solomon had built the temple, the first temple, it was at the Feast of Tabernacles where they consecrated the temple. They carried the Ark of the Covenant in, and what happened? Smoke filled the temple, that they couldn't do their duties. Meaning it wasn't just the Holy of Holies, but I think the whole inner court might have been covered. The Shekinah, the glory of the Lord, settled down on the temple when they consecrated it. And ever since then, the Jews expect God to perform mighty deeds of God's presence at Tabernacles. And they go to, well, today they don't, but then they did. They would go to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast in the temple. And that's what Jesus was doing in Jerusalem at this time. And as he walks along, he sees this man, born blind. Now, did he know him from before? This is just my brain that asks these questions. How did he know he was born blind? 
that Jesus being Jesus, being God, would have known these things. The disciples asked the question, so they must have known that this guy was born blind. And they say, did he sin or did his parents sin? And it's a, a bit of a silly question, in a sense. And so you realize that in those days, the, the, the Jews believed that it was sin that caused these kind of things to come on people. But if he was born blind, did he sin? In other words, did he sin in utero, somehow? Or was it sin of his parents, and he was made the scapegoat for it? Now just imagine, there's this guy sitting there on the street corner. He's a beggar. He's blind. Got no other trait. And he's begging. He hears people walking by daily. Some stop, maybe offer him something. But most just walk by. Imagine what's going through his mind. I know I'm blind, but am I invisible as well? That people just walk by. Isn't that what we do today? We stop at a traffic light and there's beggars there. <laughs> Don't look left, right. Never too sure if I should say your left or your right or your mind. But we ignore them. We pretend that we don't see them. I've started making it a, a bit of a point to greet them. You don't have to wind your window down and definitely don't shake hands. Yeah. Not, not today. But just greet them. I'm always reminded of Synod a few years ago. The theme was um, to be honest with what we don't have and to be generous with what we do. If we don't have anything to give, be honest. And say, hi, how are you? I'm sorry, but I have nothing to give you. But if you have something to give, be generous with it. Not generous to the point that you yourself now have to go and do without. Look, if it's your fourth meal of the day that you're going to eat, maybe you can, I mean, look at me. <laughs> maybe you can do without that. But you don't want to put yourself into the poor house just to help other people, because that does no good. But be generous with what we've got. But acknowledge those people. They are no less than we are. We may think we, you know, quite large, but actually we are ordinary people, just like everyone. Let's acknowledge them. That's what I think this guy must have been thinking. Am I invisible because people just walk by? And then he hears footsteps of a larger group, and he hears it stop. And he's heard the spiel before, it's been there countless times. Someone says, who sinned, this man or his parents? And he thinks, oh yeah, here we go again. I know the story. I know where this is leading to. But then Jesus says something which is different. He says, neither he or his parents, nor his parents sinned. This happens so that we see God's glory. That's really what comes about. Do you notice that the man doesn't ask to be healed? He doesn't ask that. Unlike, the, the, there's another healing at the pool of Bethesda, where there's the lame man, who says, if it is your will, you can heal me. He asks. This man doesn't. And Jesus bends down. Now, I imagine that this guy must have heard this. He bends down. Does he hear the sound of spitting? And the next thing he feels is the sticky goo being applied to his eyes. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not so lucky with someone spitting in mud and applying it to my eyes. But he feels this. Now, what can he do? He's blind. He, he's just kind of sitting there. There were two pools, Bethesda and Siloam. And Siloam was a holy place. It was fed by a spring, so it was living water that was coming in. And Bethesda was, uh, I believe, filled with rainwater, so it was also living water. But there's a fantastic story that goes along with Bethesda and um, the, the, the Greek god um, Asclepius that goes with that. And, um, I don't have time to talk about it, but if you want to do a bit of research, go and have a look. Or maybe you'd like to attend a Bible study where we do talk about these things. But Siloam was a holy place. You see, one of the things that would happen during the Feast of Tabernacles is daily the priests would go down and take a jug of water out of the pool of Siloam, come back up to the temple, and um, there was a whole ritual that went on with this living water in the temple. Before our reading, a couple of chapters before, Jesus stands and he says to people, I am the water of life. I am the living water. Imagine 
the, the Jews of the time, knowing this ritual that's happening in the temple. Knowing what is going on there. And yet this guy is saying, he's the living water. Anyone who thirsts has come to me. What was also happening was every evening they would light these giant, um, the word that was first given to me was menorahs, but it was, uh, the pictures that I've seen, artists' pictures, was uh, like a long lampstand, if you like. It, it looks to be about four meters tall, or maybe even taller. And they would have huge fires burning in these things through the night. And it was said that the, the light coming, uh, there were four of them, the light coming off this was so bright that not a single courtyard in all, in all of Jerusalem wasn't illuminated. And Jesus' words in this story go on to say, I am the light of the world. That's the backdrop, is these giant uh, menorahs, if you like, with all this light. People from, the, from that time would say it was a spectacle to behold. You could see it from anywhere in the city. And here Jesus says, I am the light of the world. First he said, I'm living water, and now I'm the light of the world. If you knew that before, wonderful. If you didn't, I hope the scale has fallen off your eyes and you just see the deeper meaning in the story. Jesus says to him, get up, go and wash off in the pool of Siloam. He gets up and he goes. Or did somebody have to help him? We don't know. Practically, I think somebody led him to the pool. I then have to think to myself, did he get into the pool and, and, and fully immerse himself in it? Because it's possible it was what the Jews would call a mikvah, where they would do ritual cleansing of themselves before going into the temple. Or did he go and kneel on the side? I mean, being blind from birth, did he, did he know how to swim if he fell in? Practical things. I like the idea that he actually got into the pool, perhaps sat on a step or something, but he immersed himself in the water and washed this gooey stuff off his eyes. And I wonder what was going through his mind at the time. I also like to think that when it was applied to his eyes, he may have smelt the dirt. And as he was cleaning it, the miracle that occurred when he could see did he tie it up to the fact that dirt, dust, was put onto my eyes and tied up to the dust that God created humanity out of? Did he tie it up, his healing of the creation? I wonder if, if he saw that. I'm hoping he did because he would be a lot better than, than I am. And as he washed the screwy stuff off his eyes, did he see light immediately? Did it take time for this to settle in? Was, was, was his brain hurt by what he saw? We don't know how old he was, but he was a man, so he must have been well on, well, not well on years, but not a child. What went through his mind as he saw these things? I don't think it made a lot of sense. He, he had no idea who healed him. No idea. He never saw Jesus' face. He knew something miraculous had happened. He saw people. He saw colors. He saw light. Now Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He saw light. Imagine what was going through his mind. And as he, I imagine, stumbled back to where people were, and he was looking around, his eyes must have been wide open, trying to take in all of the stuff. Or maybe they were squinted, I, I don't know, but wide open just fits my story so much nicer. And people would have looked at him and said, is this the blind guy, the blind beggar? But he can see. And our first reaction is, oh no, that can't be true. It must be somebody who just looks like him. And when they spoke to him, he said, it is me, I am the one who is blind. And they said, how did this happen? And he would tell them the story about the mud and the spit and washing his face. And now he can see. And they said, well, where is the man that healed you? And he said, well, to be honest, I didn't get a good look at him. I think that's funny. The blind guy didn't get a good look at him. <laughs> but um, I didn't get a good look at him. 
having been blind all the time. So you'll have to forgive me. I just don't know who he is or where he is. The crowds thought that the religious authorities may know, so they took him to the religious authorities. They took him to, to those who were in charge, the Pharisees. And the Pharisees interrogated him. Now imagine this. This guy, a miracle has occurred. He can now see. He is seeing amazing things. He can see his hands. He's looking at people. He has seen wondrous things, beauty all around him. And here the interrogation comes. Bang! Who did this? How did it happen? Why this? Why that? And most important, he was healed on the Sabbath. Now, a construction worker who had been mixing, well, they wouldn't have had cement in those days, but let's say mixing mud to stick bricks together or whatever. That was work. Putting water with sand and mixing it was work. Jesus worked on Sabbath to heal somebody. He broke the law. It's understandable that the authorities were pretty annoyed at this. Because if we're going to run around breaking the law, how can we be a holy people to our God? Yet they missed the point. Holy work was being done on the Sabbath. But the law became more important than the end result. And from every side, I think the man was bombarded with questions. Who did this? When did it happen? How did it happen? Do you realize today is a Sabbath? And he became the object of, of their derision in, in, in a way. No one said, Hallelujah. No one said, praise God, that you can see. Not one that we read of. And I'm certain if it happened, the Bible would have recorded it. But the fact that it leaves it out tells us that nobody said that. All they wanted, the religious authorities, was to get a scapegoat. They wanted somebody to blame instead of somebody to rejoice with. This man's parents were told him, and said, is this your son? And they would say, yeah, that's our son. He's the one born blind. How he can see, we don't know. And when they were questioned more, they said to the religious authorities, well, ask him. He is of age. Now, this was a way for them to get out of the problem. Because you see, all life was tied up to the temple. If they were kept out of the temple, they were cut off from life, essentially. And they were too scared to really stand by their son and say, yeah, this is him. And they just... You know, Teflon shoulders, ask him, he's of age. And they just slip away. We don't know what else happened to them. And he has to stand there and answer the questions. And uh, after all these questions, nobody asked him how he was feeling. Nobody asked, does the light hurt your eyes? And if you've ever slept outside and you wake up on a sunny morning and you open your eyes, it hurts a little bit. Part of it may be the bubbles from the night before, but with the bright light it hurts. Yeah, no, nobody in that here knows what bubbles is, so it's okay. That's, that's good. Um, but nobody asked him, do your eyes hurt? <coughs> nobody asked him, what will you do now? He's been a beggar his whole life. If he had learned to trade, surely he would have been playing that trade. But he wasn't. Now he can see, he can't be a beggar anymore. Nobody thought about that. What are you going to do now? And finally the man said the one thing, the only thing that he knew to be true. He says, look, all I know is this. I was blind, but now I can see. The only truth in his life. And immediately that guy, who had never seen Jesus, becomes a witness to the Savior. And when people in the world today say to us, but you've never seen Jesus, how can you walk around telling us all these wonderful things? Go back to this story. Here's the blind man who never saw Jesus, but he could witness because of what Jesus did for him. And the question with this goes, when last did you recognize what Jesus has done in your life? When last did you recognize what God is continually doing in our lives? Do we see it? Because it's happening all the time, all around us. But I think we've become, I don't know what the right word is, but we've become so insensitive to, to these things that we just don't recognize it. When you get your paycheck, 
do we thank God for that? When you come home and your wife has cooked you a great meal, do we thank God for giving us such a wonderful wife? Who can cook such great food? Do we thank God for giving us the means to have the food? Small things in life that can just become commonplace. Do we thank God for being able to gather here, even though we are small in numbers? Do we thank God for being able to freely talk to Him in our country? Do we thank God for opening our eyes every morning to give us another day? That's why it's called the present. It's a gift from God for another day. We miss these things. We just carry on with life. But that once blind man became the witness to a saviour he had never seen. Working uh, out his own faith, in, in, I mean, these things must have been running through his mind what was going on. He had to figure out what life would mean for him not being blind anymore. He was no longer just a part of the landscape because he could see. He wasn't just a landmark in the city anymore. You, you know how it would have gone? Um, Somebody new to the city comes along and says, I want to go to this market or that market. And they say, well, that's easy. Walk down this street, on the corner, there's the blind man, turn right, three blocks down the market to the left. He became a landmark. No longer will he need that, because he can now see. The religious authorities never seemed bothered by his struggle as a blind man. Because if they did, why weren't they helping him? Why did they allow him to sit in that corner to beg and to get scraps from people? Why did they allow people, and they themselves even, walk past without acknowledging this man? Never bothered. Never ever bothered. I think he was simply to them a sign, a very real sign in their community. What happens when people don't follow the rules? Being born blind is, a, is, is the, the, the root cause is sin. Sin in your life or sin in your parents' lives. You didn't follow the rules, so therefore that's what you've got. That's what people thought in those days. But now he was healed. People were forced to recognize that he could see an inconvenient truth. That here this person who we've all thought was a sinner, and that's why he was in that condition can now see. Now what? And I can just imagine people standing around saying, well, we've all called him a sinner. And look at this. Now what? It takes a very big person, very big person, to admit that they were wrong and go and find the truth. We don't read it anyway that this happened. I think the the, the religious rulers were, were so angry at what had happened. I think they were so embarrassed by what had happened that they had no option but to chase him out of the synagogue, which they did. He was no longer welcome. Get out. Wonderful, wonderful Christian behavior. Get out. It happens today still. He's making them uncomfortable. He's presenting a truth to them that they don't want to see. And go out there, go and sit in the street corner because we can walk past you. But when you come in here, that's all we can see. So now you're no longer welcome. They chuck him out. I think he might have stumbled down the steps. Totally in a daze. How could this be happening? This, this is amazing what has happened to me. It's beautiful what has happened. I have been healed. But I'm now kept up. And he sits down on the steps, and I think he could have sat there looking, looking at people walking along the road, looking at, at mothers and fathers walking with children, and the parents perhaps walking with a bit of purpose, and the children flitting from one side of the road to the other. Oh, there's a butterfly. Oh, look, there's a caterpillar. And perhaps even, oh, there's a marble. I'm going to pick that up. Now I look at our little grandson, and that's exactly the way he walks around, with wonder in his eyes at seeing all these things in the world. And I'm reminded by a story, and that's where I should have started, but 
Um, there was a, a, an American architect, Lloyd Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright, who, who was, um, uh, well, he was the founder of what was known as organic architecture, where he, he um, designed buildings to fit into the natural surroundings so they wouldn't become an eyesore. I thought that was quite neat. He, he died before I was born, so um, I never met him, unfortunately. Not that I would have, but anyway. And he tells a story that one winter, he was about nine years old, he walked across a snowy field with, with a very reserved uncle, a very conservative uncle. And when they got to the other end of the field, his uncle turned to him and said, let's look at our paths. And they turned around and they looked and the uncle said, you see my part of the fence, then it sees the cows, then it sees this, and eventually you come here. His uncle says, this is a very important lesson we can learn. And years later, Frank says, it is an important lesson. He realized that we mustn't be so focused on the, the end goal that we miss out on life around us. And here he's sitting, I think, on the steps, looking at life around him, looking at what people are doing, looking at the wonder of builders, of butterflies, maybe of worms, seeing birds for the first time, seeing the blue skies. What's happening in the world around us? What are we hearing about China? For the first time in who knows how many years, people have seen the blue sky. Maybe this is a bit of healing for the world that is coming about. But as he's sitting there wondering what he's going to be doing, a stranger comes and sits next to him. And what does the stranger say? Well, I like to think it's something practical like, hello. And he immediately turns and looks at the stranger because he recognizes the voice and he knows this is the one who healed him. And for the first time, he sees Jesus. And he says, are you the one? And Jesus says, I am. Immediately, he goes down on his knees and he worships Jesus. He knows what the truth is. Unlike the religious leaders, unlike everyone in the synagogue who pretends to be so religious, this guy who was the outcast, social outcast, knows who Jesus is and he worships him immediately. How blind are we? How blind are we in our societies today? Do we recognize Jesus when we encounter him? Do people recognize Jesus within us when they encounter us? Are we blind to that as well? Do we see when Jesus comes to rescue us, when God comes and finds us, the lost sheep, the outcasts, those thrown on the side? Do we see that? As we struggle, I think, with uh, coronavirus and this global pandemic, um, measures that will come down the line, and it's got to happen, we will be put into a lockdown. We are going to be wondering what's going on. People are really fearful. And they are fearful for what's going around them. The Bible's clear. Fear the Lord. Don't worry about the other things. But don't be silly. There's, there's a pandemic. There's, you know, don't, don't go and hack everybody in the street. Not only may you get coronavirus from them, but you could be passing it on to them. You need to be very careful with that. We need to just remember that God sees us. God knows us. Not just on the outside. On the inside. Sometimes it's frightening to, to realize that God knows me better than my wife knows me. And the most amazing thing, the good and the bad, God still loves me. The good and the bad, God still loves you. Because God sees who you really are. A lot of people are starting to say, why has God forsaken us? Why has this happened? Why this, why that, why the next thing? But those same people are also the very last ones to ever give God thanks for the good things that happen in their lives. It's amazing how we are. Something bad happens, it's God's fault. Something good happens, it's God's fault. I'm a wonderful person. And we need to really, really focus on this. God is present with us today. God is active and interested in our lives. Jesus' death was not for nothing. We are being saved from something far worse than we can ever imagine. Getting the coronavirus, well, it's a flu. Some may die, 
very unfortunate, very sad for their families, very sad. Hopefully it's not going to be us or ones that we know, but I think that hope is unfounded. I think we'll, we'll see that. It's a tragedy, but it doesn't mean that God has forsaken us. Not at all. Not at all. We need to keep our eyes focused on God. We need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. We need to be talking daily, multiple times with God. We need to be in prayer. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. Not to supernaturally protect us from this virus. I don't doubt for one minute that that wouldn't happen or couldn't happen. But I don't think it's going to happen. I think this, we need to use our brains. We need to say this is what's happening in the world. Yes, we will be protected. Weapons formed against us will not prosper. But is this really, you know, people are running around saying this is of the enemy not going to do something? Or is this a consequence of what we as people in the world have done? Time will tell. Right now, I don't know. But this morning, something made me go and have a look on social media, and I came across this poem that was actually shared by Di Hunnevold, for people who know her. And I read it, and I thought it's amazing, and I put it into the sermon. History will remember when the world stopped. And the flight stayed on the ground, and the cars parked in the street, and the trains didn't run. History will remember when the schools closed, and the children stayed indoors, and the medical staff walked toward the fire, and they didn't run. History will remember when the people sang on their balconies in isolation, but so very much together, in courage and in song. History will remember when the people fought for their old and their weak, protected the vulnerable by doing nothing at all. History will remember when the virus left and the houses opened and the people came out and hugged and kissed and started again, kinder than before. That had such an impact on me this morning that there's just no way I could leave it out. And perhaps that's the lesson that we need to learn. Just to be kinder. Just to be kinder. Not to go in the shops and buy up all the uh, sanitizer. Because if we're doing that, we're missing the point. The only way we're getting through this is if everybody uses sanitizer. The only way we're getting through this is if everybody can get fed. Because if they're not, they become vulnerable. They can get ill. So I can have hordes of, of sanitizer at home. I'm still not protected by all of those people that are getting sicker. I think I mean, we need to start sharing. We need to be a kinder world. We need to start seeing the people that need our help. This selfishness that is, 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 is a global epidemic, pandemic, I think it's something that I can see, needs to end. It has to be. And I think this is what is going to put us in that place where we recognize we are in this together. We have to work together. And just one act of kindness can go such a long way. So don't walk past that landmark beggar. Go and find out about them. Go and ask. It doesn't also mean that you've just got to give away everything. Because there's a lot of opportunists out there just taking whatever they can. We've all been given a brain. Use it. Think about it. And as we read the scriptures, when we do go into lockdown, and I, I do suggest you read the scriptures, read it and start questioning. Start asking. The internet hopefully will still be alive. Lots of information on Google. Read it with an open mind. Not all of it is true and correct. Read multiple things and start forming new ideas, start learning about what the scriptures really mean and what they really say. Figure out, go and, and there's, there's a wealth of information on what the cultures in, in that time was really like. Go and see what it is all about. Let us pray. Great God of mercy, we just ask that you show us today and every day from now on how we can in our own way. Being a great God of mercy, we just ask that you show us today and every day from now on how 
we can, how we can ease the lives of someone who's kind of merciful to them. It doesn't just mean in financial means. Sometimes how we can people just need ease the plight of some people. We need to be able to see them. It doesn't just mean in financial means. Sometimes people just need emotional support in the way that, that you would have us receive that. And we look toward you. We look towards Jesus Christ. Only you can direct us in the way that, that, that you would have us feet. 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 feet in our kingdom. We look toward you. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to ask ourselves the most important question. Give us the courage to